Rabbi Sachs, thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, you're a renowned thinker. I've admired your writing for many, many years from the other side of the globe. It's a great privilege to meet you personally and to be able to draw out some issues that we think are of great importance to contemporary Australia as, as, as they are to Britain and the rest of the West. Can I begin by saying that you've pointed out the English philosopher John Locke's distinction between liberty and license. Mm. Liberty being the freedom to do the right thing, mm -hmm. license being the freedom to do whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like, mm. without any sense of responsibility. Now, many social commentators, uh, you among them, I think, worry that we're losing sight of true liberty in our individual lives. Mm -hmm. We're slipping into license. Mm. Why has it become easy to confuse the difference? Well, it's interesting, you know, um, there's a fundamental difference between freedom from and freedom to. And uh, I like the explanation that uh, the American journalist David Brooks gives of freedom to. He says, freedom to play the piano. Yes. He says, in order to have freedom to play the piano, I basically have to chain myself to the piano. It's a whole discipline. If I want to have that liberty of playing the piano well, then I have to renounce many other things. I have to make a choice to renounce choices. So liberty is about freedom too. It's about all the restraints and the disciplines that you need in order to have a free society. Whereas um, in the West, I think for the last half century or maybe even more, we've put the emphasis on the freedom from. The person who did this most famously was the late Sir Isaiah Berlin and his famous two concepts of liberty, his 1957 lecture, where he settled for freedom from rather than freedom to. Now, why did he make that choice in 1957? Because he felt that the biggest threat to liberty in the West was totalitarian societies, specifically the Soviet Union. I mean, he'd come to Britain fleeing as a child, fleeing from the Russian Revolution in 1917. So he emphasized the freedom from, which is all about license. It's all about worrying about a totalitarian state that is going to tell you what to do. And therefore, for you, the most important thing is freedom from. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. I thought that made sense in 1957. It doesn't make any sense today. Because the biggest threat to liberty today is the collapse of Western liberal democracies, yeah. because we don't have any moral beliefs and commitments anymore, or at least we find it very difficult to say what those are. And I think we have to see liberty the way David Brooks sees playing the piano. You actually have to learn disciplines and you have to forego certain things. Otherwise, you lose liberty. You've, I think, been doing quite a bit of work and, and, and have a book coming up on the question of morality. What is it? Where does it come from? Yeah. So what is morality? Can you have a society without a, 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 a sort of underpinning of commonly agreed values? Well, this is another experiment we have been engaged in since the 1960s. Until 1960, nobody would have believed you could have had a society without a moral consensus on fundamental issues. As we know, that consensus was basically dismantled throughout the whole of the West in the 1960s. The whole idea of uh, a sexual ethic, the whole idea of the sanctity of life, whether it be abortion or euthanasia, all of these things came into question. And um, so for the first time ever, people began to think is this society is a, a, a group of people held together by a market economy on the one hand, a political system on the other, but nothing else. The market gave you freedom to buy or choose whatever you want, and the liberal democratic state guaranteed your freedom to live as you like. And that meant no shared morality. Now, can you survive like that? Well, the short answer is um, 
for a while, but not very long. And we are beginning to see now the discontents. We're beginning to see people really asking, what is it to be British, Australian? What commitment do I have to love my neighbour? So I, I, I think we're just at the dangerous end of an experiment that was very radical in its time, and we're beginning to pay a price for it. The ultimate expression, perhaps, of those uh, what have to be seen as deep divisions. David Brooks himself talks about 60 years of narcissism uh, and of ruthless meritocracy, leaving us divided and tribalised yeah. and distrustful. Yeah. Uh, seem to be uh, what we're seeing here in Britain now with Brexit and the inability for people to hear one another, respect one another, find a way together uh, by negotiated yeah. consensus. Sure. And indeed, Trump's America, very deeply divided. Sure. Morality, I think, is the we within the I, the thing that inside my head that tells me to be concerned about other people's welfare. If we lose that, all we have is the I. And in the end, if we don't have you and I a shared set of values, a shared framework of reasoning, then in the end, probably, we will arrive at the conclusion that the loudest voice wins. That's when you get very divisive politics, like the politics of Brexit or the 2016 American presidential election. And you begin to realize that people have lost that ability to reason together, which is part of feeling that we're all members of a single moral community and that we have to deliberate together because we're in this together. You made a comment recently which uh, particularly interested me uh, around the disintegration of our moral language, even the language has changed and words that once guided us, yeah. I think I have you right there here, uh, right, wrong, ought, duty, loyalty, virtue, honour, now they sort of have an antiquated, a musty air about them as though they're from a bygone era. Mm. Have you heard mo many of those lately? They, no, just, I haven't. They're just not in circulation. No. And they're incredibly, incredibly important. You know, um, the concept of honour, for instance. You know, um, the, the, there are certain things you do. Let's say you're a highly successful business person. There's certain things that you don't do because they're just dishonourable. And that constrains you from certain things that might be very much in your advantage, but very much to other people's disadvantage. And to know that you're dealing with an honourable person who recognises certain codes of what you do and don't do, that generates trust, lose trust, and you lose everything. So again, going back to David Brooks, because he's written a magnificent book and we've been talking about it, uh, The Road to Character, recommended people should uh, get a hold of it and read it. Uh, but he describes, I think, the sort of drift into narcissism as, 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 as being centering on this idea that I don't stop and think about you, it's all about the big me, the drift towards the big me. So perhaps the big me, if it's all about me, we don't think we need these sorts of uh, mm. words, we don't need the concepts. But I had a long time in the Federal Parliament of Australia and it strikes me, struck me then, it strikes me now, that we live in an age when we inculcate in our children that it's, they're the centre of their own universe. It's all about them, the big me, as Brooks has put it. But we loathe that value system when we see it reflected back in us, uh, to us, by the people we elect. We say, they behave as though it's all about them. Don't they understand? It's not. They're there to look after us. They're there to serve us. So in a sense, I think we're actually very conscious that we don't like where the demos has gone, where we've gone. That takes me way back to uh, Moses meeting God in the burning bush. And God tells him, go and lead my people to freedom. And Moses says, who am I? And God says, in effect, it isn't about you. <laughs> Leadership isn't about the leader. Leadership is about the people you lead and the cause you lead for. So, um, and that's a wonderful uh, antidote to narcissism. In the end, the great leaders are the people who attach themselves to something bigger than themselves. And that is what really makes heroes out of people. I think we have had, once you take morality out of the equation, 
the we, then you're only left with the I. So lose a little moral dimension from society, you're going to encourage narcissism, come what may. But one of the real dangers here, and um, I hope I'm not too down on these social media, is this whole world of Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram is all about the presentation of self. Here I am, look at me. It's a, it's a call for attention. It's, it's, it's a kind of a construction of, a, of an image which can sometimes be very narcissistic. So I think the technology and the morality here have created a bit of a perfect storm. I think it's a very interesting line just to pursue for a moment. Uh, I was trying to explain the other day that I've come to see this issue of the way social media is being used as turbocharging for our young people the capacity to model the way we now relate to one another, mm -hmm. whether it's bad behaviour in Parliament, mm -hmm. whether it's the modern tendency to cut people off if you disagree with them and not engage with their ideas but to demonise them. Social media has made it possible to turbocharge that to the point where I think you used the expression, if a young person steps out of line too badly, they can be so ostracised as, as though they're cancelled. Mm. And we know in Australia from some, we have a problem with youth suicide. It can have devastating effects. Oh, uh, the problem of uh, teenage suicides is pretty, uh, pretty widespread in the West and very, very bad here in Britain. We had a report recently which said that a quarter of 14-year-old girls had self-harmed in some way uh, in recent years. So uh, these are having devastating effects, cyberbullying and rejection and this feeling of fear of missing out, FOMO, all these things. Um, they're really playing havoc with teenagers' emotions, especially uh, teenage girls. Now, I think you've done quite a bit of traveling, haven't you? Just, you've been around sitting down with young people, mm. talking with them sympathetically, out of a concern for their well-being, mm. you know, very honorable motives. What have you learnt? You've just touched on some of it, but where are they at? How do they make moral decisions? If we've said the very language of relationship and of commitment to one another's become antiquated and musty through lack of use, what sort of frameworks are they using to make I'll tell you what frameworks they use. Uh, some of them find it at home. Right. Some of them find it among teachers. Some of them find it among role models. Um, very interesting role models, you know, journalists, sports stars, people who have done things that they regard as brave or um, courageous or, or, or honourable, you know. Um, and I, I find that, um, you know, although they like any of the, the kind of formal curriculum or the doctrines that we used to have, they do recognize good role models when they see them. I'm sure that's right. I once saw a leader talking to a group of young people and he asked them in their groups to discuss who they most admired. Mm. And then he pulled the whole group together and each group had to explain who they'd most admired. And when they'd finished, he said, do you notice almost none, of, well, none of them actually, they were not people who were highly wealthy or extremely glamorous. They were all mm. people who had about them mm. qualities of the spirit, if you like, yeah. and of decency and of humanity. Yeah. They're the people we really admire. Yeah. So that's who young people are looking for? Yeah. I still think we probably need to do more though to return to a consensus around which we can give them a better framework on how to confront the moral issues that they're going to live with throughout their lives. Well, I had this extraordinary privilege of doing a five-part series for the BBC on morality with some of the world's greatest experts, people like David Brooks and Jordan Peterson and you know Steven Pinker, the neuroscientist, and, and Mike Sandel, the Harvard uh, political philosopher, a lot of these people. And... Uh, on these programs, on each program, we had an interactive session in which young people, 17 and 18 year olds, um, reflected on what they heard from the interviewees. And it was the verdict of everyone who heard the series 
that the young people were the stars of the show. Now, stars of the show in which the other voices were the world's greatest experts on these various fields of sociology, psychology, politics, economics. So I am tremendously impressed by young people today. I think we went through a bad period, the me generation, the epidemic of narcissism. We went through a very bad period. People tell me that um, iGen or Generation Z or whatever you call it, the kids born 1995 or onward, have a much more realistic approach to things. They know that life is going to be hard. They don't have the sense of entitlement that maybe kids of a generation earlier had. Um, and um, I found them to be engaging, altruistic, realistic, streetwise, but in no way cynical or disillusioned. So uh, one of the biggest surprises for me was just how hopeful uh, I came away from this encounter with young people today. It's reassuring because they're going to face some enormous challenges. Yeah, I think they know that. Economic as much as anything else. But this comes back to the point that you made, really. You know, you've got the market economy, you've got uh, government, the state, and then you've got a civic society. And, and what I find interesting in many ways about what's now become, becoming known as the Peterson moment is that young people are keen to hear from him what is effectively a pretty tough message. I watched him in front of uh, young people in Sydney, sell out crowds, particularly young men. And it wasn't as if he was just a motivational speech, a speaker telling them that they were wonderful and the world was wonderful and if they just did this, that and the other, everything would be all right. And far from it. He was saying, you know, redemption will not be through the political process. It will be at the level of the individual. You need, every one of you, we all need to examine ourselves long and hard and be honest about our failings, our shortcomings, go back to our bedrooms, tidy ourselves up, then go out and be noble. So I think that, that, that fits with what you're saying about their realism and desire to rise to the occasion. Jordan Peterson is our generation's Mr. Tough Love. Yes. And that is the voice that has been missing. And, um, you know, instead we've had what the late Philip Reef called the triumph of the therapeutic. It's all about your feelings. Or we had the whole 1980s movement of self-esteem. And Jordan Peterson is cutting through the whole lot of that and saying, no, it isn't. As he said on our program, the world needs you to get your act together. Yeah. <laughs> He's saying, get on with it. Stop worrying about feelings and start actually make your own bed. You know, um, a whole series of books by Navy, U.S. Navy SEALs have been bestsellers in the States, essentially delivering the same message. I think um, that is a voice that had been missing. And it's an interesting voice. I'd call it the Victorian virtues voice, you know, um, which is get up and you know, get on with it. And it's a mark of how systematically that had been removed from our culture that a Jordan Peterson emerges as, a, as an inspirational figure. Because actually he is just a figure out of time. Yes, that's right. 12 rules for living. Yeah. For, for people of 50 years ago, they would have said, what's the fuss? Yeah, sure. It's obvious. Sure. And one of the interesting things he said, I, I, I heard him say this. I didn't realise the full significance until I, I stopped to think about it. He said, don't think an empathy culture can sort out your life for you. Because that's the message that we get too much now, I think, uh, from some of the cultural elites who, who want to say, well, you're all victims, unless you're a victim maker. Um, and uh, an That is culture, really what drew me to Jordan Peterson his absolute refusal to endorse a victim culture. Yeah. I, you know, my moral tutors, the most powerful moral tutors I've ever had in my life, have been Holocaust survivors. Now, these people really were victims. Mm. 
their lives were, were, were full of victims. And yet, these were some of the most life-affirming people I ever met who simply refused to look back, refused to define themselves as victims, said, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to begin life again in a new country without my family, so my fellow survivors will become my family. And what did they do? They built careers, they had jobs, they built marriages, they had children. And then, 50 years later, but not before, they started telling their grandchildren what had happened to them. They became the most non-victim people I ever met. Um, there's a remarkable book now, it became a bestseller in the States and here, uh, called The Choice by Edith Eger. Edith Eger was uh, like the late Viktor Frankl who went through Auschwitz. Edith Eger went through Auschwitz, survived, survived the death march, eventually moved to America, became a psychoanalyst, used all the pain in her life to heal the pain of others, and then wrote her first book at the age of 90. Wow. And became a bestseller. And it's a life-affirming book. And that is the meaning of the name of the book, The Choice. Will you or won't you see yourself as a victim? So everything that I had learned from the Holocaust survivors uh, chimed with everything I was reading about Jordan Peterson especially his daughter, Michaela, who had this terrible illness. And, um, and Jordan was explaining to me in our interview about how they had agreed very early on, she had agreed, never to see herself as a victim. That's incredibly powerful. Mm. What you've just said ought to be something that every young person who's being tempted to paint themselves as a victim should hear because it's actually a terrible entrapment. It's not a release. It's not an answer to the problem. To see yourself as a victim essentially means to see yourself as powerless. You have placed yourself at the hands of the victimizer, the oppressor. Now, you, you can't do that. You're giving away your life. It's also, uh, it strikes me, uh, a, a situation where you start to fail to examine your own conscience. It's not your fault. Sure. It's everybody else's fault. Sure. And that always seems to me to be a bad place for a person to go. Peterson again tells each one of us, go and face the reality that the, 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 the dividing lines between good and bad that we <clears> draw around the place don't run between you and me or between me and... Um, you know, somebody in another part of Australia or a different sex or whatever. Mm. It's somewhere across here for every one of us. Yeah. And we need to understand that freedom in a way depends upon us being honest. Freedom <clears throat> means accepting responsibility. And that's a big leap. Rabbi Sachs, the Peterson moment, people's response to it, seems to me to again point to the fact that we all need meaning and purpose. We need to know who we are, why we're here. Is there any sense to be made of it all? Mm. Does it open the way again for people to start to re-engage with faith, do you think, in the West, which beca has become almost ridiculously secular? Well, I have tried to formulate um, a distinction that I think is important between science and religion. And I formulated in this way, science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. So religion is about the pursuit of meaning. That is its fundamental role in life. It is not a pseudoscience or an alternative to science. It is about meaning. I think the more that we become scientifically sophisticated, the more we will begin to realize that science cannot deliver that. From a strictly scientific point of view, there is no meaning. The universe just happened. We just happened. It was all a massive accident. There's no purpose to it. There's no logic to it. 
um, it's a mere random happenstance. And that is because science is always looking for causes. And causes are always before the events they cause. So science is always looking for something in the past. But you and I, whenever we get up and do anything, we are facing the future. Whether it's pouring ourselves a cup of coffee or making a major business decision, we are going trying to bring about some future state of events that hasn't happened yet. And that is what meaning is all about. It's all about what is this big story of which I'm a part? And where is it tending to? So science is always looking backwards and finding explanations. Religion is always looking forwards and finding meanings. And I feel this very, very strongly um, as, as a Jew. You know, one of the things that makes Jews Jewish is that when somebody asks us, has the Messiah come? We always say, not yet. We're always looking forward. So I, I think the more we realize that science is not going to substitute for religion, it's not going to give us a, a story, a narrative, a plot, the more we will turn back. The way Jordan Peterson does and looks at the great classic meta-narratives, the great stories that have framed our expectations and hopes. We won't look back as people tritely do today and say, well, Genesis disproves God. Mm -hmm. You've said some quite powerful things about the triteness of the way in which we say, well, it didn't happen in seven days, therefore Genesis is a fairy tale. I, you know, I cannot get over how uninterested the Bible is. Yeah. I mean, it gives it 34 verses yeah. for the entire creation from, from, from beginning to end. Yeah. And what's it telling us? It isn't trying to tell us the how of Big Bang. It is trying to tell us some really rather fundamental things. Namely, number one, a very controversial proposition historically, that God looked at the universe and saw that it was good. This universe really is good. It isn't just an accident, it is good. Number two, that he created every one of us in his image. We would not get Western justice, democracy, liberty without that idea. And the loss of that idea is what's been undermining those freedoms. We've lost the capacity to see the spark of the divine or sure. to recognise it in one another. Sure. The idea that a higher authority says, I may disagree, I'm free to disagree with you, yeah. but I'm not free to therefore trash you or disrespect yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, separation of church and state in America, but they still have on the dollar bill, or do they still have? In God we trust? I think they do. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so the fact is that without trust in something bigger than you, you are not going to get a stable democracy. And I think you can see this very simply in two famous sentences, two historic sentences, both of them taking place towards the end of the 18th century. You've got the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is a religious sentence. It says all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator. That's a religious sentence. 1789, the French Revolutionary Assembly, all men are born and remain equal in rights. A completely secular sentence. Yes. And within months, within years, yep. revolutionary terror yep. and the complete breakdown of, of, of liberty. As a profoundly important point. One revolution resulted in freedom yeah. because of its understanding of our true condition. Yeah. The other, a man-made and ultimately quite an evil proposition, sounds attractive, yeah. produced bloodshed, mayhem yeah. and a mess. Yeah. Hmm. In fact, I think uh, you summed it up beautifully uh, recently. One doesn't need to compromise to bring unity but one does need to recognise the integrity 
of one another's opponents. Yeah. Either that might be understood in the context of Brexit and a divided America. Yeah, I think we've lost this wonderful thing, probably the single most distinctive feature of Judaism, the art of argument. <laughs> we never stop arguing. I mean, Abraham argues with God, so does Moses, so does Jeremiah, so does Job. All the rabbis in the Talmud spend their time arguing with one another. Why? Because that is how you arrive at truth through the collaborative pursuit, through respectful listening to your opponents. Mm. And I think truth emerges from that process. And once you lose faith in reasoned argument, which is losing respect for your opponents, really, mm. I'm right, you're wrong. How did Bernard Lewis once put it? I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. Mm. You know, that, yep. that you know, so Sums it up. you lose that respect for argument, then you lose your respect for your opponents and you have pure division, not just pure division. You did see, I think, in the um, American presidential election, real demonization. Yes. You know, I mean, families broke up over yes. this. People lost friends because they could not speak respectfully mm. to one another. And, and Americans is, march under banners saying, not my president. In other words, my fellow Americans can't be trusted with democracy. Yeah. They should be, all their political capacity to be involved should be cancelled. That's a yeah. terrible thing to say. I mean, democracy means abiding by the rules even if you mm. lose. Yeah. And uh, we're forgetting that. Someone said to me the other day, it doesn't mean, if, I, if I disagree with you, it doesn't mean I hate you. It may mean I love you. I'd love to go back then uh, to university. And you and I were younger once, and in the late 60s, uh, you headed off to Cambridge to study philosophy. And you talk about that quite a bit. One of the things that you've said is that uh, your professors taught you that morality was no more than the expression of emotion or subjective feeling, and it was within limits, whatever I chose it to be. You went on to say, to me, this seemed less like civilization than the breakdown of civilization. What's happening in our universities? It was obviously starting then, it seems to have continued. We look to them to provide the skills, the education, the capacity to discern truth, to arrive at uh, informed decisions. And no one seems to feel they're doing as good a job as they could at the moment. Philosophy in the uh, 1960s, throughout the West, I think, uh, reached a very bad point and, and a very significantly bad point when they came up with the theory known as emotivism, which is morality is just the expression of my feelings. Now, if morality is just the expression of my feelings, there's no argument about feelings. You know, the argument. You like tea, I like coffee, you like you know, ice cream, I prefer uh, whatever. You know, there's no argument about this. So um, you have made moral argument impossible. Once you've made moral argument impossible, you have kind of disbanded the, 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 the basis, the intellectual basis of the university, at least the university philosophy department. And I think that that was when something began of which we are really seeing the consequences today of if since i can't since morality is only a matter of my feelings and since my feelings matter to me if you distress my feelings then i don't want you talking to me and then we get into this whole situation which has affected universities certainly in the States and Britain and, and, and Australia, I gather, of no platforming, yes. of safe spaces, trigger warnings, trigger warnings microaggressions. microaggressions, all these things, mm. which are there for a very reasonable reason to protect students' feelings. But there's something beyond students' feelings, which is reasoning through to what is a justifiable feeling and what is an unwarranted feeling that there's something that makes certain emotions rational or appropriate and others irrational and inappropriate. 
that was always the job of philosophy from the days of Aristotle. You know, am I, am I feeling too much or too little? This is the whole enterprise of Aristotle's ethics. What emotion is appropriate to the circumstances? Am I being cowardly, courageous or foolhardy? So somehow or other, this abandonment of Aristotelian reason and this emphasis on emotion, which happened really in the, between the 1930s and the 1960s, laid the foundation for what I see as a dangerous um, situation in today's universities, which is that the views that students don't agree with are simply hounded out. And Jordan Peterson himself has suffered from this, um, being um, debarred from having a research fellowship in Cambridge uh, this summer. Um, my uh, Another philosophy teacher of mine, Sir Roger Scruton, um, being accused of all sorts of things and removed from a government appointment on the basis of an interview in a journal which um, is widely acknowledged to have been a misrepresentation of his views. Can I just say on that point, yeah. I've watched that closely mm. because it's very obvious that he was tried, judged and executed before the facts were on the table. Uh, the new statesmen were in the end forced to publish the full text of the interview and it became very clear that uh, his views had been misrepresented. Um, I think people like Roger Scruton and Jordan Peterson fall outside of the consensus. But that is what a university is about, to give space to those people who fall outside the consensus. Otherwise, we are back at the situation in 4th century BCE Greece where the citizens of Athens sentenced Socrates to death mm. for corrupting the young. Mm. Well, I don't think they'd sentence anyone to death nowadays, but social death, Social yes. death, social ostracization, can, being cancelled. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier. To, to tease us out a bit, this, what, what you might, for want of a better term, the empathy culture, you dare not offend somebody. You want to wrap them in cotton wool. I don't mean to say that we should be cruel, but you know what I mean by that so that they're not offended. Your courses are designed around not offending students as a priority, rather than challenging them, stretching them, exposing them to different thinking. That seems to be very much against young people's interests. That's the first point. The second point, though, that strikes me as remarkable about the so-called empathy culture is that the point you've just made. If you dare to disagree with it, politeness goes right out the door. They don't seem to matter how badly they hurt you or break you or damage you. Mm -hmm. How do we understand this desire on the one hand to mollycoddle people and wrap them in cotton wool so that they're not challenged, but to absolutely excoriate anybody else who dares to adopt a different position in the field of ideas? It's a very deep and beautiful idea. It's a very religious idea. Common to Judaism and Christianity, hate the sin, love the sinner. And this belongs to a particular view of morality, which says that I am one thing and my acts are another. That I can criticize somebody's acts yes. without devaluing the person. And we're losing that distinction. And we're losing a similar distinction between me, the person, and the views I happen to espouse, or the life choices that I have. When I was a student at Cambridge, my postgraduate tutor, the late Sir Bernard Williams, yes. was Britain's most distinguished atheist. He was the most distinguished philosopher of his generation, but he was I mean, an absolute genius, a lapsed Catholic, and an, an incredibly brilliant man. And I by that time had become quite religious. And we could not have been more different. It was just, it was, there was a, a, an abyss between us in terms of our beliefs. But he never belittled my beliefs. He never felt, let me feel humiliated or rejected or in any shape or form. He was 
respectful the whole time. The only thing he insisted was that I was lucid, that I was cogent, that he understood what I was saying, that it made sense. And so I felt very, very respected, even though my views were clearly very challenged. Um, and I think we lose that. And today, we have to get back to that situation of seeing that the university is really fulfilling its role in preparing us for the public conversation, mm. preparing us for meeting people who are not like us mm. by teaching us to listen respectfully to those with whom we disagree in the sure knowledge that they will listen respectfully to our views. And that's what universities should be modelling. That's a sort of do unto others as you'd have them do mm. unto you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It often requires... You see, love is not always just a feeling. It's a doing thing. Mm. It's a willingness through gritted teeth to say, mm. I disagree with what this person is saying so strongly that I'm tempted to give and take offence. Mm -hmm. But the minute we do that, we're both going to be diminished mm -hmm. and we'll get a suboptimal outcome. Mm. We have to. I mean, I had to learn this in politics. You know, you've got to rise above it and seek to engage with the idea. But that's not what we're doing at the moment. There's, there's something that follows on. In our judgmentalism, we seem to be finding it very hard to forgive. Well, I feel very strongly about this. Um, the Americans, after Pearl Harbor, did something extremely interesting. One of the most interesting things I ever came across a government doing. They realized that they were going to have to wage war against a country they didn't understand. And so they asked an anthropologist by the name of Ruth Benedict. And basically they said, Ruth, explain the Japanese to us. And she did. And it was later published as a book called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. And she explained the difference between a shame culture yeah. and a guilt culture. Shame and honor, guilt and righteousness. Very, very different cultures. America is a guilt culture. Japan was a shame culture. Now, in a guilt culture, there is that separation between the person and between the sinner and the sin. So that um, even though the person sinned, nonetheless, um, they remain intact and you forgive, you can forgive. A guilt culture is a culture of forgiveness because the person remains pure whatever. A shame culture is unforgiving. If you have been shamed, then, you know, you go off quietly and commit suicide. Yes. Now, the West, being a Christian guilt culture, always had space for forgiveness. But today, we, the West is no longer a Christian culture. It's a media-driven culture. And we are in one of the supreme shame cultures of all time. That's what viral social media do to you. You get it wrong, that's it. You are shamed for life. And shame cultures don't have space for forgiveness. And that's why we've lost forgiveness in public life. Very dangerous. It is unbelievably dangerous. I mean, forgiveness essentially tells us that we are not held captive by the past. It also tells us, I think, does it not that we're loved? Yeah. And respected? Yeah. I do think that uh, in the way that we've abandoned so much understanding of our own history and our own culture, the loss of an understanding of the importance of forgiveness, after all, the founder of Christianity, mm. uh, Asked the question, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? No, seven times 70. In other words, we've been, as we've been given much, much might be demanded of us. I do wonder how we rebuild harmony without a willingness to properly recognise that others will stumble as we stumble 
and have to be given the opportunity to get back up again. The waste, at the very least, is terrible. The human carnage of a lack of forgiveness seems dreadful. I remember in uh, <clears throat> 1999, when um, the NATO operation in Kosovo, do you remember that? Yes. The, and I was making a, um, I was making a film for the BBC. Each year I would make a, a film just before the Jewish New Year. And we decided let's do it from Kosovo, which had not yet um, got back to normal. Uh, the NATO troops were still guarding everywhere, but the 300,000 refugees of the Kosovo and Albanians, the Muslims, were coming back. And I stood in the middle of Pristina, amid all the bomb rubble. And I said, this is where you see the power of one word to change the world. Yeah. The word forgive. If the Kosovo and the Albanians and the Serbs and the Croats can forgive one another, then they have a future. But if they can't, they are destined to replay the Battle of Kosovo of 1389 yeah. till the end of time. Yeah. All peace agreements between nations and between individuals depend on a capacity to forgive. That's a profound insight. So I don't think we can let go of it. I mean, if, if Christianity, if Judaism had given humanity nothing but this, it would have been sufficient. I think I'd throw out a gentle challenge. Uh, I often do this to the postmodernists. What's your substitute? Mm -hmm. Given the place you've taken us to, yeah. what is your substitute? Yeah. What is the substitute for forgiveness? It's a, it's a rhetorical question, so to speak. I mean, the substitute for it is forgetfulness. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's how you do it if you don't have forgiveness. The trouble is that now anything recorded uh, on the internet yes. is there forever. It's not forgotten. We have abandoned forgetfulness. Yes. So we jolly well better get back forgiveness. Now, you told a remarkably powerful story about victims of the Holocaust effectively forgiving, not playing the victim card. Uh, what is it, though, that is now seeing that graciousness, if I can put it that way, repudiated by a rise of anti-Semitism in many Western countries? Well, here we come to a subject which is very much Jordan Peterson's as well, which is victimhood. Anti-Semitism, when, when bad things happen to a country or a culture, they can ask one of two questions, and the whole fate of that culture will depend on which of the two they ask. They can ask, what did we do wrong? Or they can ask, who did this to us? If they ask, what did we do wrong? Then they go through the necessary business of repentance, remorse, whatever it is, putting things right again, and then they go on and they recover. But when they ask, who did this to us? They define themselves as a victim. And any victim must have a victimizer and oppressor. And when any culture has suffered some kind of major confusion or humiliation, and they say, who did this to us? They are looking for a scapegoat to blame. And historically, that turned out to be the Jews. We were the most significant non-Christian minority in a Christian Europe. Israel today is the most significant non-Muslim country in a largely Muslim Middle East. One way or another, if people are looking for someone to blame, they will use the Jews. Um, there's usually no substance to it. 
anti-Semitism is 99.9% .9 pure myth. But myth has this power that it takes away the pain of asking, what did we do wrong? Oh, we can blame somebody else. And right now the turbulence in Europe is providing that kind of fruitful ground for three tributaries in this new river of the new anti-Semitism. Some of it is coming uh, from Islam in the Middle East, and some of it is coming from the old far right and far left that still exist in some form or other throughout Europe. It's a shattering thing to think that uh, this could happen within living memory of the Holocaust, but it has. It is indeed a shattering thing. So, in conclusion then, and on that rather sombre note, can I again say that your work in pulling people together and encouraging them to think calmly and rationally and reasonably and in a spirit of cooperation and forgiveness uh, is remarkable. Can we, at this point in the life cycle of Western societies, rebuild sufficient virtue and civic glue, to use the words mm. of our foremost uh, political editor in Australia, uh, so in order to, if you like, regroup, rebuild harmony and even prosperity. There is a Harvard neuroscientist called Steven Pinker. Yes. Very interesting man. Wrote a book many years ago called The Language Instinct, in which he tells a fascinating story that I really didn't understand. There's something called a pidgin, you know, pidgin English? Mm, yes. Which is a language that slave owners used to slaves. Yes. It has a vocabulary, but no grammar. Right. Yes. It's just right. commands and basic yes. things. It turns out that second generation speakers of pidgin, the children of slaves, basically, develop something called a creole. And a creole is a pidgin plus grammar. These children, without any formal instructions, have created their own language out of the very fragmentary language that their parents had. Because we have within us something called the language instinct. So even though you think that slaves have lost their language, their children recreate a language on the basis of those fragments that their parents have given them. I think the same applies to morality. You know, we're in a kind of pigeon situation. We've lost the grammar of morality. We still have a few of the words, but we've lost the whole grammar of it. But I tell you, the next generation, the generation growing up now, will turn that into, into a Creole because not only do we have a language instinct, we have a moral instinct as well. And those young people that I meet are just so impressive. They really are. They know how dangerous the world has become. They know perfectly well how hard they are going to have to work just to make a living, but certainly to make a life. Well, one of the problems they've got is that we're handing them a financial mess. We are handling them a financial mess, yes. And that is something that I feel very, very bad about. So do I. But I do have faith in them because they are going to bring back some of the morality that's been missing for the last 50 or 60 years. I pretty strongly think that they're going to learn forgiveness as well. I don't, can't tell you whether they're going to become more religious or less. I think some will go one way, some will go another. But I do think they have a moral instinct. And I do think they're going to build a world of which we can be proud. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.